Henry J. Hendricks is a retired United States Navy captain. He has served as an American defense analyst and official historian and curator of the Navy and an author. His written work has focused on the composition of the United States Navy force, the structure of the Navy, the role of the aircraft carrier in modern strategic environments, and the structure of the carrier air wing. He also publicly supported a recent plan to build a 350-ship Navy. Jerry Hendricks is a president of Hendricks & Associates. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe to help new people find the incredible speakers on the channel. And if you enjoy the content and want to consider supporting us, do please become a patron or buy me a coffee. Jerry, I'm absolutely privileged and delighted to welcome you back to the channel for the third time. And I have to say it's by, by popular appeal. Well, it's a delight to be here. And I only wish that we were close enough that I could buy you that coffee so that we could sit down and continue these conversations in person. I probably uh, slipped some scotch into it as well as we were uh, just discussing before we hit record. Today's episode is going to be all about China. We we may try to make some links there with Ukraine as well, um, but really we're focusing on Taiwan, China, and of course the global ambitions of China. Uh, and as a uh, manufacturing exporting power, um, trade routes via sea as well as land, of course, are important. So that's going to be the core theme of what we discuss here. Um, is this a good time to discuss Taiwan? Because, of course, there was much speculation that with uh, Russia moving into Ukraine, um, you know, some people were saying this would make more likely that China would make a move on Taiwan and some less. Um, what's your view on that? Well, uh, I've actually written and spoken about this uh, publicly. I've, I've, I've laid down the thing that you're never supposed to lay down, which is a timeline on when you think things are actually going to happen. So, you know, predictive models uh, are seldom correct. However, I believe that we're starting to see a series of trends, um, uh, conditional trends within the Chinese state that are suggesting that they're going to have to move sooner rather than later. Uh, so, for instance, China has a demographic trend in which their aging population is outpacing uh, their working uh, age population. That's largely as a, a result of the one child policy, which began in the 1970s and continued up until about a decade ago. Uh, so we're increasingly seeing one child that's responsible for the care of two parents and four grandparents. And so you're, you're seeing that dynamic. So in, their, their, their structure is upside down in many ways. Also, the, uh, the Chinese economy, uh, ever since the West, the United States leading, and then also Europe is starting to look more carefully at it, this idea of decoupling from a dependency upon the Chinese economy uh, has come at the exact wrong moment uh, for China. If you look at what the Chinese are saying, uh, including um, at this week's uh, meeting in San Francisco, is they want the West to continue to investing in China and China's future, which is to say giving them money. Um, China has been sort of the, the production shop for a lot of high-tech uh, uh, things like Apple iPhones, but also things like uh, shoes, uh, for you know tennis shoes and manufacturing. So they have a very cheap labor rate. And so they're dependent at this point in time. They do not have a consumer class. There is no middle class of sufficient size in the Chinese economy that if the West pulls out of China so and starts buying, stops buying its products, that somehow the Chinese could step in and start buying those products themselves. That, that simply isn't going to happen. Um, China is also uh, very aware that not only are they dependent upon the West for uh, selling their finished goods. They're also dependent on overseas supplies of raw goods, uh, whether it's from Australia or Africa or South America, um, where they've made these significant investments in ores and trying to do extractive economies. Well, they're starting to get pushback now. So if you look at the Australians, the Australians are raising questions about continuing to support the Chinese economy. Africa has found that the Belt and Road Initiative, where China makes significant investments in your country, gra grants loans, has come at an extreme price because the Chinese come in and they're not hiring locals. They're not improving the local economy, really, uh, as they do this. They're bringing in Chinese workers. They work these mines. They're extracting. And then that all goes home. So anyways, all these things are coming together 
uh, and it's bringing pressure to bear upon Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. And so they're under more and more domestic pressure at home, um, <clears throat> and which leads me to believe that they will begin looking for some sort of a distraction um, you know, for the Chinese. Now, Xi has committed publicly to uh, bringing or reuniting with Taiwan as if Taiwan had ever been part of China, which it has not been historically. Uh, but we're going to reunite with, with, with Taiwan. And that has become the standard of success. He is in the third term of a two-term chairmanship of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. And the definition of success is whether Taiwan comes back in or not. Um, and so if it doesn't, he's a failure. He knows that he'll be a failure historically. Last part of this, you know, adding it all up, uh, the Biden presidency. The American uh, uh, foreign policy establishment and national security apparatus is the only thing that actually keeps China from invading and taking over Taiwan. Um, if there was a strong belief that the, the America would intervene and intervene strongly, they won't do it. However, given Joe Biden's disastrous withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan and then the, the shakiness of his initial support with Ukraine and what's going on right now in the United States so far as Ukraine aid has raised questions as to whether the United States will come to the aid of Taiwan. So Xi uh, dares not wait for the next presidency that will arrive in January of 2025. So we can't wait until November of 2024 when it will be decided. He certainly can't wait until January of 2025 and, and have the threat of perhaps a stronger president uh, who would resist him. So I actually firmly believe that China will make a move against Taiwan in the summer or fall of next year, 2024. And, and we're already beginning to see certain things like, and I'm going on long here, but, but they have been buying up extra food store, uh, stores, soybeans and pork. They've also been buying up extra ore, 150% of their normal purchases on the futures markets. They're buying up energy, food, and raw materials. They understand that economic sanctions will follow an invasion of Taiwan, and they're banking it right now so that their economy can keep going and they keep feeding their people if there are strong economic sanctions. I think it's all pointing to something in the middle of next year. And there are extraordinary parallels, aren't there? We have uh, Russia with an aging president who is uh, long beyond his legal term, so has had to essentially restructure the country uh, from a hybrid autocracy into a full autocracy, um, create a distraction, uh, again, extraordinary parallel, and you're looking at a brittle regime which has failed to develop a middle class. Um, there are extraordinary parallels there, other analysts would point out that whereas Russia has traditionally over many centuries been a militaristic society, so the kind of aggression we're seeing is absolutely in character, China, however, has traditionally not been an expansionist empire. Um, do you think that's the wrong way to look at it? I, I do think that's the wrong way to look at it, and mostly because of historic timescales that we're looking at here. So um, I've, I've got a couple charts that I often refer back to that shows the growth of Russia over time from the Duchy of Moscow outward, uh, always looking for additional buffer space uh, in order to gain additional uh, uh, defense in depth. Well, if you step back and look in uh, early China, you know, 400 B.C., and you actually look at the warring states period, and then you look at the way that China has grown with successive layers of protective states, which they have reached out, conquered, absorbed, osmos, and kept going. They also have this really strong habit of building walls. So we all know about the Great Wall of China, but there's actually been seven successive eras of wall building in China. The first walls begin in very close. The next ones have gone out. The Great Wall is actually one of the last walls to be created. And I think that actually it was the uh, Indo-Pacific commander, Harry Harris, Admiral Harry Harris, who once coined the phrase that when China built those artificial islands in the South China Sea, 
that this was China's new Great Wall of Sand in the first island chain as it was beginning to build a defensive barrier. China, much like Russia, tends to look at the world as the outer barbarians. In fact, that's how they refer to us. If you, if you actually ever speak with someone who speaks Mandarin and can listen to the Chinese as they speak, the language that they use to describe their competitors, whether it's Japan or the Philippines in close, or we Americans in the West, you know, it is inherently racist, it is vile, uh, it is angry, it's insulting, and, uh, and we are various forms of barbarians uh, when they refer to us speaking amongst each other in common language. This isn't them trying to insult, this is the way that we're referred to in common uh, conversations. And so they've already colored us in conversations with their population and with their people as uh, less than human. And you know, that's the first step. Anytime that you're gonna have a war with someone else is you have to dehumanize the enemy so that killing them somehow does not on par with killing civilized people. And by the way, for the Chinese, the only people who are civilized are the Chinese. Everyone else is some lesser form of barbarian. And that's another extraordinary parallel. We saw uh, fairly early on in Putin's regime, um, othering uh, of, of various peoples, that then really ratcheted up in 2014. And that's where we saw the real intensification of genocidal language. It was, however, it must be said, calling on uh, models and tropes that have been used throughout the Soviet Union in the 19th century and and, uh, and so on. So that kind of othering of Ukrainians is, is, is not uh, unique to Putin. But the ramping up of genocidal language and then full-scale invasion, there certainly seems to be a pattern there. Do we see uh, an increase in state propaganda or the use of propagandists, as we've seen in Russia? Or is this something that's likely to come with an invasion? So, I, yeah, first of all, it is starting to ramp up. Um, and also, there's a, there is a slow motion part of the Chinese, because they've existed for nearly 3,000 years as a, as a, as a, as a recognized state and, and governing people, they have to, they, they tend to think in longer time spans. So, you know, uh, the Chinese think in centuries, you know, we think in budget cycles in the United States. And so uh, there has been a ramping up of the language. And also, by the way, you know, I would point out that uh, within um, my lifetime, you know, we've seen a subjugation and a near genocide of the Uyghurs, the Tibetans uh, were conquered just prior to my own birth, uh, and the language is still used to describe the Tibetans. Uh, we watched Hong Kong fall, and the language being used against the West as well as um, local Hong Kong citizens uh, to, to police them, uh, to subdue them, to jail them, anyone that smacks of freedom. And now the way that the Chinese, they alternate um, with conversations in describing the citizens of Taiwan. Um, and also, you know, the brushback pitches, uh, an American term, um, that they use with regard to Japan and the Philippines as if do not consider hosting the Americans or supporting the Americans or, or helping the Taiwanese. Um, these are things that the language, I mean, we just went through a round, a year and a half a round of wolf warrior diplomacy where the Chinese were going out and hectoring and lecturing the world um, about how they should and should not act with regard to China and China's interests. And I would also point out that in the very first meeting between the Chinese foreign ministry and leaders of the U.S. Department of State, uh, which occurred, I believe, in Alaska shortly after Joe Biden was sworn in uh, two and a half years ago, um, that, that meeting began with a long diatribe where the Chinese foreign ministry lectured the Biden team to make sure they understood that China was ascendant and America was in decline and that you people better get on board and, and get out of our way. That didn't go over well, although I was disappointed that the Biden team did not get up and leave the room uh, at that point in time as they should have. But the point is, is that word got back to the rest of the country and, and we didn't like that at all. And this is another commonality here. And um, I, uh, on this channel, we're, we're not partisan in terms of left-right politics, yeah. but we, we look at, at policy. And it seems to me that Ukraine also is a failure of deterrence by 
successive uh, US administrations. Um, but one would have thought that during the full scale war, and if you understand Russia's mindset, um, the mindset of the gangster, the mindset of the bully, that you need to push back hard. And as you said earlier, show your intent to police red lines, to reinforce red lines, and to, uh, you know, not accept the kind of aggression we've seen. Um, do you think that the administration, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, key people within it, have been sending out the wrong signals or mixed signals to Putin? Yeah, so do you mean Putin or Xi? Uh, both, <laughs> both, in fact. Okay. I mean, essentially, so Putin, it, it seems interesting. to me. By the, by the by the way, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, what we've seen in Ukraine and what is going on now with China has been a generation of bipartisan failure. Um, you know, I, I happen to have worked with a strategist who called China as the rising competitor in the mid 1990s, and no one would listen to him. Um, and so, whether it was the Clinton administration or the Bush administration or the Obama administration. Um, I would I would point out, and this is kind of uh, hard for me to say, um, because very few people give the Trump administration high marks uh, on on diplomacy. But Trump did something that no one had done well since uh, Dwight Eisenhower and possibly Ronald Reagan, which was he introduced an ambiguity into U.S. foreign policy that was good in the sense that, you know, uh, no one wanted to test Dwight Eisenhower, uh, for instance, with the, uh, there was uh, the shelling of the Taiwanese islands during the middle of his administration. And there was some concern that China was going to go then against Taiwan. Uh, it was also some uh, issues in Vietnam at that point in time. But no one wanted to test Dwight Eisenhower on whether he was going to pull out the big guns and use nuclear weapons or was going to respond with conventional forces. Because after all, this was a guy who had rolled the dice on a 12-hour window on June the 6th in 1944 to invade Normandy. So no one was going to test Ike. And Ike maintained that strategic ambiguity. Reagan also evidenced um, a, a sense that you can't predict what I'm going to do, so therefore you shouldn't try. And Donald Trump brought that same outsider unpredictability to his foreign policy. So despite the fact that Ray, uh, uh, Trump had a very bellicose reputation in his language, he actually had four years in which uh, almost absolutely nothing happened in the world that went against uh, U.S. interests, mostly because no one could predict how Trump was going to respond. But Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Biden have essentially followed a very predicted diplomatic route of conciliation and trying to bring people together. And people have used that to advance their interests. So for instance, Joe Biden has made it very clear um, that uh, number one priority from his administration standpoint is addressing global warming. And so uh, both, both Putin and Xi have held out tentative that if you cooperate with me on these things, I may cooperate with you on global warming, your number one priority. And, and of course, no one who's kind of realistic, and I'm very cynical and realistic on these things, thinks that there is any chance whatsoever that Xi Jinping is going to come across with dramatic reductions in uh, CO2 emissions from the Chinese economy. Just not going to happen, probably within my lifetime. And I'm 57 years old. So this whole idea that we're holding out the promise and uh, and trying to cooperate with them while they're doing all these other bad things in the world uh, is probably short-sighted and strategically unwise. So I, I think that they're playing us because of our best intentions. And that raises two questions, one on the Russia-Ukraine side. It still, still seems that almost two years in, Putin, uh, whether that is from uh, poor information, which is quite likely, but also he is observing the reaction of the Western powers, the dithering, the incrementalism. He may believe that not only will we lose interest and he'll be able to eventually win, whatever that means in Ukraine, he may also believe that in five or six years' time he could roll over the Baltics, for instance, and couldn't guarantee that we wouldn't just stand by and let it happen. That failure to deter um, 
if you apply that to the Chinese scenario, does that create a very dangerous situation? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why I think China moves uh, sooner rather than later, because one, they are watching us um, expend our resources and our strategic focus in drips and drabs rather than uh, move uh, quickly uh, in, in, with, with scale uh, and with ferocity uh, to, uh, to pursue our national interests. Uh, in many ways, this is very similar to the calculation that Osama bin Laden made uh, in 2001 when he attacked us on 9-11-2001 because he had watched a series of setbacks, whether it was the coal bombing or the World Trade Center initial bombing or the bombing, uh, um, you know, overseas bombing of some of our embassies and sites, um, he saw that what he thought was a progressively weak horse, um, to use the language of the Middle East. And so he thought that he was going to attack us and that the response would be we would kind of curl up in a fetal position at that point in time because we were a weakening people. Um, the reaction that we had caught most of the Middle East totally by surprise, uh, which we call, you know, what, what we in Americans call the Jacksonian impulse, which is you can poke me and poke me and poke me, and I'm going to ignore you and ignore you, ignore you, and then you're going to slap me one time, and then I'm going to go full killer mode, which is something that's uh, very, very central uh, to the American response. We call it the Jacksonian impulse. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned that, in fact, uh, by going drips and drabs in our support with Ukraine, rather than coming in very strongly uh, with the types of systems that we need in order for Ukraine to win decisively by recovering their sovereign territory, uh, that in fact we are heightening, we're first, first of all, we are prolonging the war, we are increasing the cost of the war, both to ourselves, the West, and to the Ukrainian people in terms of Ukrainian lives, uh, but we're also inviting growing instability in the world where we're inviting you know, China to essentially invade Taiwan, thinking that, hey, I can outlast the Americans too. Yeah, it'll be bad. Uh, it's going to take me a few years to consolidate my hold. Uh, there's going to be some economic sanctions. But, you know, hey, if I can stay in Taiwan for two years, uh, you can't really remove me at that point in time. We will establish a new status quo. So we're setting a very bad precedent right now. And now I would push back. I'm not sure that Putin would be able to move in the time span, five years, I think you said, into the Baltics, because quite frankly, uh, he's being bled white right now. He will need to take time to consolidate his hold over Ukraine if there was a negotiated peace, uh, which I'm opposed to. Um, he would need time to consolidate that and then rebuild his forces in his conscript army and, and quite frankly, reassess his military, which has performed very disappointedly uh, before he would take on something like now I'm actually going to uh, uh, attack NATO uh, and see the full. I mean, let's face it. Um, it is only by sheer acts of diplomacy that Poland is being held back right now from responding. Poland so desperately wants to jump ugly. Uh, with the Russians in Ukraine. Um, and if something happens with the Balts, well, hey, you know, I doubt that Poland will even give us a phone call before they start moving uh, to come to defense. Just they're going to look over their shoulder and say, y'all coming with me or not. Is this another risk then of, uh, let's say, the sort of, uh, you know, traditional arbiters of the peace, uh, the US, Britain, etc., being somewhat uh, in the rear guard? Maybe less so Britain, but we've run our capability down to a, to a ridiculous degree. Does this leave it open for... Um, less predictable actions. So if the US isn't going to step in, uh, if, say, Trump was elected and he he he, he didn't step in, uh, you think Poland and others, this 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 creates a um, an unpredictable scenario where others would would start to take the lead there. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I think the entire thing becomes a dice roll at that point in time, including, by the way, if Trump was reelected um, to be the 47th president, um, I know that he has said that he would negotiate a peace within 24 to 48 hours, which I'd be really interested to see how that would go. And I'd probably be greatly opposed to the outcome. Anything that cedes sovereign territory to an aggressive power, you know, I would be opposed to. However, that being said, anyone who thinks that they would be able to attack the West and that somehow Trump, with his personality, would not feel compelled 
to come to their defense to demonstrate that he is a strong, great leader, uh, I think underestimates how Trump would think and how the United States would think uh, and what part of the country he represents. Um, the, the other aspect about, but this goes to this predictability. One of the things that bothers me is that as people talk that about so sort of nonchalantly about the fact that we're moving away from the unipolar moment and that we're drifting back to spheres of influence is that, you know, anyone who's read, you know, Hans Morgenthau's book about the various different global international systems will understand that a world that is dominated by multiple spheres of influence is an inherently unstable world from a diplomatic standpoint with sides, with, with, with spheres switching sides, and quite frankly, leading you know, to a greater proclivity to war and conflict. This is one of the reasons why the bipolar world between us and the Soviet Union was stable, and the unipolar world with the United States in the lead has been one of the most peaceful times in world history, you know, writ large over the entirety of the globe. Anyone who thinks that, well, we should just go ahead and accept that history moves on and we're moving back to a multipolar world should be understanding that we're moving back in that same sentence to a war that's going to be marked by strife and famine and disease. And that is not the world that I want for my children and my grandchildren. And if we translate that into naval power, naval power has been incredibly important in maintaining um, free trade around the world and uh, using power projection to make sure you know those rules are followed. What what in past generations has that sort of scenario looked like in the the sort of multipolar or, or sphere of influence world in terms of uh, you know world trade piracy all these kind of things how does that translate well if, if you look over my shoulder and right above my finger here is a copy of my book to provide and maintain a navy uh, which i wrote in 2020 which actually traced the fact that the west had come up with this idea of the free seat and free trade. And this actually uh, predates the Enlightenment. This is Hugo Grotius writing in 1609, talking about the need for free seed and free trade, that, that the ocean is a place where mankind can trade uh, wherever the wind may blow a ship, uh, so long as it doesn't impinge upon the interests of another nation. And so we've been pursuing this idea of the free sea and free trade for, the, for, for all the time since, but it never became manifest on a global scale until after 1945. And it was only made manifest by the fact that the United States emerged from World War II with 6,700 ships, and the Royal Navy was at 1,000 ships at that point in time, and there were no other navies on the planet. And so here you had the two major maritime powers totally believing in free trade and the free sea. And so we made it happen. And so if you actually look um, at a chart that shows the rise in global domestic product across recorded history. It remains fairly flat with just a gentle, gentle rise, really minuscules of a percentage of GDP per year across the entirety of human history until 1945. And then there is dramatic exponential growth over the last 70 years where global production and global trade and the quality of life across the world has gone up. Uh, the number of individuals in extreme poverty dropped dramatically. The number of literate individuals climbed dramatically, all during this era of the free sea. And so when you think about the fact that the U.S. Navy today is at 290 ships and the Chinese Navy is at 370, and that the Chinese are opposed to the free sea, and for that matter, opposed to the concept of free trade, they want a centrally planned global economy with them at the center of that economy. Uh, Russia also, as an autocratic authoritarian state, is very interested in that as well because they want predictive buying of their energy and supplies. They want to be able to predict when the goods are going to arrive. These centrally controlled autocratic states are uncomfortable with the concept of free trade because a free sea with free trade upon it becomes a medium that allows for the transmittal of a vector of freedom into their countries via their ports and their markets. And they're very uncomfortable with that. So 
I think that the issue is we look at the falling off of the American Navy and for that matter, the shrinking of the Royal Navy over the last uh, 30, 40 years since the end of the Cold War. What we have seen is uh, an erosion of our ability to uphold and promote the free sea and free trade. And we're only now becoming aware of this sort of moment of existential threat uh, because we are behind in a competition that's very vital to the future of mankind. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, that so much of the debate around the erosion of, uh, you know, working class incomes, the debate around uh, migration and so on, it focuses very much on land borders. And it seems to look at those issues in isolation. It's it's a very good one for, for leveraging to get people angry, to get people divided and arguing. Rarely does the debate center on freedom of the seas, exponential rise in wealth, and um, the investment required to maintain that. Um, does it frustrate you that this, this clearly and very important part of the puzzle uh, just seems to be missed entirely? Uh, it, it 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 greatly frustrates me, uh, especially because, um, in many ways, we are victims of our own success, because we have been so good at securing the seas and the commerce that transmits upon the seas that the ocean has become assumed. So, like the air you breathe, the idea that I can access the ocean and all trade flows upon it, it's just an assumed part of human life. When in fact, it wasn't. You know, it was there was piracy and there was war and there was interdiction and 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 you know and and ships were sunk and and so on. You know, for the better part of human history until 1945. Um, what I what I find also about it and and you can just look at it. Okay, look at the size of the container ships or the super tankers or the what we call China Max ore carriers. China Max ore carriers are 400,000 tons. That is four times the size of a nuclear aircraft carrier built by the United States. Um, there is also these huge ocean liners and cruise ships that are out there that haul around thousands of people. Now, you only make the investment, you know, you with your dollars, uh, stockholders, company executives, you only make that type of investment in large container ships and LNG carriers and everything if you think that the, the sea is free and the sea is safe. Otherwise, you never pack that much money into one platform, uh, even though it's the most efficient mode of doing commerce. But you only make that investment if the, the sea is free and safe. If the world changed tomorrow, if you woke up tomorrow and it was not a free sea, all of those types of ships go away. And they will be replaced by smaller, faster cargo vessels that will be able to outrun the pirate or the other naval power that would run them down and interdict them. Also, the idea of the rise of tariffs. You know, the Chinese, uh, the, the Russians in the high north in the Arctic and the Chinese in the South China Sea have openly talked about the fact that they want to impose a pilotage fee if you move your ships through those waters because they claim those waters as their internal waters, as if they were like the uh, Mississippi River in the American, uh, in the middle of America. Um, and if you want to, if you want to transit that, then you, you need to pay a pilotage fee and have one of our pilots come on board. Well, that is otherwise known as a tariff or a tax uh, upon the high seas. Okay, so that's something that we should all be concerned about, because I'm here to tell you, shipping companies will then begin avoiding those waters. Uh, because no one wants to pay you know, taxes or tariffs uh, to do that. So we're really starting to see the free sea system begin to fray at the edges. And a lot of it around these two powers, Russia and, uh, and, uh, and China, uh, these authoritarian autocratic states that want to reimpose centrally controlled order over larger and larger expanses of the human condition. And if we take the Russian example, we see um, collusion with Iran. We see Iran very much behind the uh, Hamas. Uh, essentially, nothing happens in Gaza without uh, Iran knowing about it. Um, even the timing of that attack on Putin's birthday uh, seemed to be, uh, you know, a gift from one autocrat to another. Uh, extremely sort of macabre coincidence alone clearly not a coincidence. Russia, perhaps lesser than China, has shown that it is willing to 
invest in disorder, global disorder, because it's not a huge manufacturing power. It doesn't ship tons of finished goods around the world. Um, it, it only uh, ships its oil and its extraction economy goods um, and, you know, has a navy to, to protect those. Russia could conceivably um, try to throw an even bigger spanner in this works by, say, funding by funding pirates, by funding all sorts of insurgent um, organizations to to crash this global system because they do seem to be the kind of hooligan at the moment trying to tear down um, anything uh, that is created by the US and its allies. Well, if you look at Chinese and Russian investment uh, in activities, uh, in social media, in groups, that are all about destabilizing the current international order. So, you know, I would contend um, that, for instance, the uh, anti-Semitism that is rising up uh, in the West, uh, certainly I, I saw the demonstration in London the other day. Uh, I've seen the demonstrations on American college campuses, which make me feel very ashamed uh, as the grandson of a man who fought against Nazis uh, and, and, and was, uh, you know, throughout Europe uh, during World War II, uh, and you saw it, see what's happening in European capitals right now, um, that, uh, that these are being funded, that TikTok, a Chinese-based uh, social media platform, is, is pushing this narrative uh, of anti-Semitism and also narratives uh, against Ukraine uh, here in the United States. So, you know, the rise of this neo-isolationist wing of the Republican Party uh, here in the United States, the, the party of Abraham Lincoln, of Theodore Roosevelt, of, uh, of Dwight Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan is now coming out and having a growing number of members uh, who are resisting uh, providing aid to Ukraine, despite the fact that uh, what's happening, uh, you know, right now in Ukraine is very much in line with the national, the last national security strategy that was signed by Donald J. Trump. Um, in December of 2017, when in his first year as president, about you know resisting Russia's aggression in Eastern Europe. So, but this this wing of the party's out there, and, and all of this is being promoted, and money is being washed through smaller groups, through college campus organizations. These activities are originating from Russia and China. So, do I think that Russia and China will spend money on trying to interdict or to to you know for the rise of piracy? Absolutely. It is pennies on the dollar type of investment to undermine the global economic system and the global system of governance, uh, which has promoted these concepts of freedom and, and individual freedom around the world. So, uh, you know, I absolutely think it's happening. Uh, I think we're seeing it at both the micro and the macro level scales right now. And we need to wise up and be smarter about the information war that's going on in the cyber war. It's not just kinetic wars and bullets. It's the war of ideas. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, John F. Kennedy um, getting berated by Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna in 1961. Um, and Kennedy, because he was a student of American history, you know, he, he made the statement that, hey, I, you know, I'm the president of the most revolutionary country on earth. Well, Kennedy was not prepared to argue dogma and doctrine with a committed communist like Nikita Khrushchev. We are no longer um, inculcated in the, the culture and the philosophy of freedom and liberty. We don't read the classics. We don't read John Locke. We don't, we don't you know, read uh, Adam Smith in, in, uh, in its entirety. We're not, we, we don't understand who we are anymore because you know, much like the sea, freedom is assumed as the air we breathe. We don't understand the level of sacrifice and commitment it takes to uphold it. And um, I'll ask a question about Ukraine there, which really uh, comes on from that. I mean, something that's uh, been something of an awakening for me and refreshing is to see how Ukrainians are not turning on each other in the face of a mortal threat. They are putting aside the labels of left-right divisions, that's not to say everyone agrees with each other. I mean, far from it. Um, but they make common cause and they find uh, areas on which they can agree. And this is extraordinary flowering of civil society. Um, 
partly, of course, it makes up for the fact that the government is just, uh, you know, doesn't fill those niches. It's not competent and, and mature to, to fulfill all of that social purpose. But there's an extraordinary uh, sort of grassroots effort to raise money for the military, um, to help uh, sort of feed and keep people warm during winter. Uh, there are numerous civic society organizations. It's an incredible flowering of grassroots democracy. Um, is this something that we should be supporting rather than, not just incrementally? Is this something that we could be learning from and which could renew our own institutions? Well, you know, I, I have a hypothesis. Um, you know, as you, as, as you know from reading my biography, I have a bachelor's in political science. Um, and so, you know, all of my initial thoughts, learning, reading were in the area of political science. And what struck me as a person who's lived, you know, from the mid 1960s, my first memory is man on the moon. I was three years old and watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. So this is the entirety of the span of my life. Um, but since the end of the cold war, which is the moment I came in, raised my right hand and came on active duty in 1988 and then served for the next 26 years, we have lost the vital center of political discourse, not only in the United States, but, but in the West. Um, because once the East-West Cold War ended and we lost that sense of an existential threat of communism versus uh, freedom and liberty, then that gave us the space to turn on each other. So we went from the exogenous threat of the other to the endogenous threat of the other guy in the room with me. And so where there used to be a very vital center of political discourse in the United States with uh, liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats uh, in, in, in our uh, uh, terminology, um, we have moved farther and farther to the extremes of both sides. And there, the, the center has been vacated. I think that this is something that you see. Now, you look at what happened in Israel. So after uh, the massacre, of October 7th, um, which occurred while I was in Scotland uh, visiting for the Churchill Conference this year, um, you saw a unity government be formed, and they were very deliberate. They wanted all aspects, left to right, to be representative in that government. Same thing, quite frankly, happens in Great Britain during World War II. Many people forget, you know, Churchill is Churchill, so so he's he's got this near God like status. But Churchill is brought in to be the prime minister of a unity government, and his deputy prime minister uh, is a socialist, um, you know, serving right along him. So it's only when we see the existential threat from the other um, that we understand that we all must come together uh, as a people, um, and we have been unable or unwilling to correctly characterize the magnitude of the threat from Russia and China right now to our way of life. Uh, China is coming, and I fear that we are not going to wake up in, to it until it's it's far, far too late to kind of conventionally deter it. And, uh, and in fact, I, I use this phrase, I, I actually tweeted this out earlier today, I keep coming back to this science terminology, this imagery in my mind, that we are well inside the event horizon of a great cataclysmic event that we've been caught up in the gravity of this black hole of war that is coming to us, and we're not going to be awake to the threat until it's too late to do anything about it. And, and then, in fact, you know, the conditions setting it up are already in motion uh, at this point in time, and we may have moved beyond the point of escape. So, you know, I, I, I hope, at least when that happens, that we will come together. Um, in, in the United States, we came together as a people after 9-11, we were unified uh, in our response to Afghanistan. Um, we, the threat from, uh, for the Taliban in Afghanistan and Al Qaeda, uh, we only began to fracture, quite frankly, after the 2003 invasion of Iraq, when that, that caused an internal debate, uh, which was useful uh, as to the wisdom of that particular policy. Uh, but we did have that moment of unity for about two years um, after um, the, the the attack on 9-11. And taking the theme uh, of, of the episode and sort of uniting what you've just said there, 
if China does decide to move, either because of insufficient deterrence on our part, or it simply sees that the window closing on that opportunity, what is that like to look like? What kind of maritime force are they going to need to bring to bear to have a chance of occupying Taiwan? And is there anything we could be or should be doing to deter them? Is there anything, uh, even in the learnings of the Ukraine uh, war, uh, for instance, sub uh, you know, subsurface drones, uh, submarines, or any other platform that could help us prepare for a potential Chinese invasion? So um, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan, I think, will look very much like Dunkirk in reverse. Anything that floats is going to be coming at that point in time. Um, we take solace in the fact that the Taiwan has got very few beaches that large landing craft uh, would be able to approach. And we think we can defend those beaches. We think the Taiwanese can defend those beaches. They have fewer deep water ports. Um, and so if you're going to come alongside to the pier to disgorge your men and equipment, you know, there's very few opportunities to come ashore. However, if it's Dunkirk in reverse, if they take every small craft and they put seven to 10 men on it and they start heading out, uh, then suddenly, although that's a very target-rich environment from the, the terms of being able to, to, to uh, shoot at them, it also is a, an environment that's not uh, uh, conducive to the type of warfare that we'd like to see. So what I mean by that, right now, we think that if we can have enough frontline fast attack submarines set up north and south of the Taiwan Strait, very unlikely that they're going to put um, a lot of large surface craft out there to make that 118-mile transit across the Taiwan Strait because they'll fear being sunk in the middle of the strait. But if if they're not coming with, with say, a uh, hundred ships, but in fact, they're coming with a thousand ships, well, we don't have enough torpedoes. We don't have enough submarines for that. Um, the best thing that we could be doing uh, really is one, you know, trying to increase the readiness of our submarine force because that will be an important part. But the other is uh, selling or giving Taiwan uh, large numbers of missiles, um, anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, other types of short-range missiles, uh, mines so that they can effectively mine their beaches and shores, um, uh, smaller arms, a defensive capability so that as China would approach them, uh, surface-to-air missile because China's first move will be to try and establish air dominance over Taiwan, um, and, and quite frankly, looking at uh, giving Taiwan as many uh, fourth-generation aircraft and having a serious conversation about whether or not we're going to introduce fifth generation. Now, I have real concerns about introducing fifth generation to Taiwan because Taiwan, quite frankly, uh, leaks like a sieve on technology from Taiwan into the mainland. So if I give them the best that I've got, the F-35, well, that blueprint's probably in, in Beijing within 24 hours of being there. But the fact of the matter is, is we need to significantly increase our foreign aid and assistance to Taiwan, I would put it on scale with what we've been giving to Israel since the Camp David Accords in the late 1970s, where we've been giving Israel, you know, three and a half billion dollars a year on average for the last 40, 50 years uh, over there. And I think that we would need something on that level uh, to Taiwan and its military and, and other agencies there. We also need to be making some significant investments in our other allies like the Philippines uh, and, and Australia at this point in time, because we're going to need them and their assistance and their basing rights and infrastructure. And I don't think they're ready to host Americans in the way that we're going to need to be hosted uh, to do a counter uh, uh, campaign to a Chinese invasion. It's, it's a very complicated thing. We're way behind. We, we are not spending enough uh, and we're not focused enough. And there are other knock-on effects, aren't there? I mean, this is this is the sort of last question here. But what would be the economic repercussions? Because Taiwan is absolutely central to the world's semiconductor industry, and of course, semiconductors are in absolutely everything and are, you know, pivotal in in the global economy growing and moving forward. And as we become more and more dependent on AI in various sectors of business, then once again, you know, the role of advanced semiconductors uh, is center stage. What would be the knock-on effects, economic effects, if China was to be uh, successful in this, or even unsuccessful, but but clearly, you know, cause huge uh, disruption? Well, the the loss of TSMC, one of the the, the most proliferate 
um, uh, semiconductor manufacturers in the world. And quite frankly, the company who makes the most advanced forms of microchips and semiconductors in the world um, would be huge to the global economy. We're talking that most of the things that we've all kind of come to take for granted in modern life, everything from refrigerators to our automobiles, to our aircraft, uh, to our phones, uh, production of all those things comes to a screeching halt. Uh, we have been trying to uh, set up uh, alternative sources for these things. The United States uh, passed a, a legislation last year called the CHIPS Act, where we're trying to reshore, uh, onshore back to the United States, uh, advanced semiconductor and chip manufacturing. We have tried to move certain capabilities out of China and build up in other places like India or Singapore or some of the other places around the, the country or the world. But the simple fact is, is that Taiwan just has such a lead in that high tech environment and, and white rooms and, and, uh, and, and closed clean manufacturing facilities that it's very hard to duplicate that. China would hope to be able to capture that intact, no damage to it, because China wants that to work for them in their economy and in their new position as the premier great power of the world um, is dependent upon having those those things intact when they when they gain control of it. Um, so I cannot understate the magnitude of the disruption to the global economy. It would make 2020's COVID pandemic look like a relatively good year economically uh, in the world. Uh, for a Chinese invasion, which is why the Chinese are investing so much now uh, to prepare for the economic sanctions. Um, and, uh, and quite frankly, I think everybody should be thinking about what this world looks like. This is one of the reasons that I get really frustrated with people saying, when I say we need to spend more on defense, they're like, well, who's going to pay for it? And it's like, you know what? That's actually not my lane to talk about who's going to pay for it. I have my own ideas but I'm not the budget side of, of the whole thing. I'm here to tell you how much peace is going to cost. I'm also the one to tell you how uh, freaking expensive war is and what that is going to mean for people on a global scale. When the, the, this next war, if it happens with China, um, is going to cause uh, ramifications which will last for a decade or more uh, to the global economy. And uh, uh, to a lesser extent, but that could equally be applied, couldn't it, to the cost of deterring Russia or even now not even deterring because, you know, we've got a full revanchist Russia there. The costs only rise uh, for uh, tyrannies, aggressive tyrannies that are on the march. Um, it's always terrifying uh, speaking with you, Jerry, but it also gives me some cause for optimism uh, that uh, we will get our act together uh, at the last minute. And even though uh, Joe may be asleep at the wheel at the moment or um, Sullivan might have slipped something into his evening cocoa, um, we hope he'll wake up in time. Uh, we hope that the, the West will wake up to the threat uh, in time from both China and Russia. I, I always wish um, whoever sits in the Oval Office in the United States, uh, I wish for them to have success uh, because success uh, for them is success for the United States. And I believe that success for the United States is success for the Western world. And so I hope uh, that everyone opens their eyes. They see the world uh, for what it is, for the dangers, for who they are and where they exist and the magnitude of the threat. And, and I, I, I wish them all the glory of a successful presidency. Uh, however, uh, I, uh, trends are not heading in that direction. Thank you so much, Sherry. That is a very uh, powerful statement to end on. Thank you so much for your time and insight yet again. All right. It was my pleasure.